my name is Madhu Grover. I'm an associate professor of medicine and physiology at the Mayo Clinic and a member of division of gastroenterology and hepatology. Uh, today, we would be covering uh, the topics of gastroparesis and functional dyspepsia, sharing some of our work in this space, as well as discuss some of the conundrums that the field is facing at the moment. So following all my disclosures, uh, we, we have received research funding from these companies uh, for some of our work in this space. So what I thought uh, we would do uh, is to try to answer these three questions. So the, uh, the, the first question is, are gastroparesis and functional dyspepsia same disorders? And is there really a utility in uh, you know, performing gastric emptying study? Second question, is there evidence of immune dysfunction in gastroparesis? And third question we would try to answer is, should patients with gastroparesis undergo G-POEM, which has been popularized as one of the leading therapeutic uh, interventions over the last couple of years? So as we think about gastroparesis and its pathophysiology, it's really a clinical syndrome that is characterized by delayed gastric emptying in the absence of mechanical obstruction of the stomach. Over the last several decades, it's been associated with a variety of cellular changes. Initial studies showed us that there is evidence of vagal neuropathy. Following that, there was an era where enteric uh, uh, you know, a neuropathy was, uh, was felt to be the leading cause, as well as smooth muscle changes. Over the last uh, you know, decade or so, uh, the loss of interstitial cells of Cajal has been the leading, uh, uh, you know, leading cellular pathophysiology underlying uh, the gastroparesis. And more recently, I would say over the last five years or so, we are learning a lot about the role of uh, innate immune system and its dysregulation in the pathophysiology of gastroparesis. And I'm gonna be talking more about that when we look at the, the, when we look at the second question. While we think about gastroparesis in that context, functional dyspepsia seems to be much more complex, heterogeneous, and driven by multiple etiologies. These etiologies range from central nervous system factors, such as anxiety and stress, visceral hypersensitivity, which could be originating from the esophagus, from the stomach, or from the small bowel, things like reflux and inflammation, both in the stomach and duodenum have been proposed to play a role in pathophysiology of functional dyspepsia, and then there could be some overlapping mechanisms with gastroparesis when there is impaired physiology of the stomach itself uh, that can lead to the symptoms of uh, dyspepsia. As we think about dyspepsia, um, uh, the Rome Foundation has suggested characterizing functional dyspepsia patients into two larger subgroups, one being postperennial distress syndrome and the second being epigastric pain syndrome. In the epigastric pain syndrome, the symptoms are uh, driven by pain predominant uh, symptomatology, and it's unrelated to the meals, whereas in the PDS subset, they're predominantly driven uh, by uh, the meals uh, that the patients consume. And if, if you look at the epidemiology, this is uh, the pie chart from Olmsted County in Rochester, Minnesota, uh, slightly uh, uh, you know, less than half of uh, the overall FD cohort have both EPS and PDS, and then there is an overlapping uh, subgroup as well. So uh, there, there has been a lot of talk about, are these two really distinct disorders or are they really the same? So when one thinks about gut and how it can express itself in terms of symptoms, there are only a handful of symptoms that a patient can experience that's driven by gut pathophysiology. And these symptoms can, overlap you know, considerably if you look at you know, variety of functional or uh, the disorders of gut-brain interaction. And these symptoms can also overlap as you think about uh, conditions like inflammatory bowel disease. Within the context of gastroparesis and functional dyspepsia, we feel that symptoms are driven by a variety of factors and these can really change over time. This was shown by us in this recent publication uh, from last year when we took a cohort of dyspeptic patients or gastroparetic patients and followed them for 48 weeks, what we learned was something very interesting. Number one, the symptoms of these two disorders were nearly identical. And number two, if you look at 48 weeks, a lot of folks who were dyspepsia, who were in the dyspepsia subgroup at baseline, uh, 
now have gastroparesis. In other words, they have developed delayed gastric emptying and the, and the patients in this cohort underwent gastric emptying both at baseline and at 48 weeks. Whereas if you look at the cohort of gastroparesis, in other words, all the individuals who had delayed gastric emptying to begin with, uh, slightly over a half remained in that gastroparesis category, whereas a, a substantial proportion of patients normalized their gastric emptying at 48 weeks, suggesting the physiology can change over time, but the symptoms may not. So what about gastric testing and gastric uh, you know, physiological assessments? So gastric emptying using the scintigraphy is the gold standard way of, of you know, assessing for, uh, for gastroparesis or delayed gastric emptying. It's ideally done using a technetium 99 based meal, uh, a 300 kilocalorie meal, which contains about 30% fat, followed by gamma camera imaging for four hours ideally, and a delay in gastric emptying, which would be suggested by less than 80% emptying at four hours would be consistent with the diagnosis of gastroparesis. Some have also proposed looking at two hour gastric emptying scans where one can think of emptying less than 60% uh, to be consistent with gastroparesis. There are other methodologies as well, particularly breath testing, which is also approved by the FDA to assess, uh, to assess delayed gastric emptying patients where an individual consumes a meal that has a stable carbon-13 isotope and then breath testing is done to understand excretion of uh, C13 carbon dioxide, and that the time when the exhalation happens gives you an assessment of emptying that happens into the stomach. As far as gastric accommodation is concerned, this is rather uh, a concept that's been around for some time, but the testing for it is still not widely available. At least at Mayo Clinic, uh, we test for gastric accommodation using a methodology called SPECT. In this, an individual uh, undergoes imaging followed by, uh, followed by ingestion of Ensure over nine minutes and then a repeat imaging. And what we are trying to understand is the change in gastric volume in response to this standardized uh, you know, volume of Ensure that they have consumed over the, uh, over the nine minutes. And ideally, we would like to see a change in ratio of um, three or more or a volume change from baseline of at least four to 500 milliliters. So why is all of this important? Why is gastric emptying measurement is, is, is important? And I'm just gonna use example of diabetes and uh, the, the multiple ways uh, diabetic uh, injury can result in gastric dysfunction. This was uh, uh, you know, used from a nice review by Dr. Raj Goyal in NEJM last year. And he nicely articulates that how uh, the blood sugars uh, both acutely as well as chronically can have a variety of different influences on gastric emptying. For example, if there is acute hyperglycemia uh, uh, you know, defined by a glucose of more than 400, uh, it can result in acute slowing of gastric emptying. While converse, if there is uh, you know, hypoglycemia that can accelerate gastric emptying acutely, Chronically, uh, there could be patients uh, with uh, both delayed and accelerated gastric emptying. And lastly, some of the medications that are used for management of diabetes, such as exenatide, can by themselves result in slowing of gastric emptying. So clinically, how is this relevant? This is a pie chart from a study done at Mayo Clinic where uh, about 100 diabetic patients uh, who underwent both gastric emptying and gastric accommodation were assessed. And all of these patients uh, presented for some sort of upper GI symptoms. Obviously, that's why they underwent these tests. And one can see a large spectrum of uh, you know, patients here where either both of these uh, you know, gastric functions were found to be abnormal or one of those were found to be abnormal or in about 28% of patients shown here on the upper right, both gastric emptying and gastric accommodation were actually normal. So what about this, uh, this phenotype of accelerated gastric emptying? It's a very interesting phenotype and we have been learning more about it over the last few years when uh, what, for example, this study showed was that if you take uh, a, a cohort of you know, a diabetic patients who have uh, slow or rapid gastric emptying, uh, 
the symptoms of these two conditions could be nearly indistinguishable. In other words, unless you measure the gastric emptying, it might be hard to predict if you're dealing with accelerated or slow gastric emptying. What about treatment? Does gastric emptying measurement help how we treat our patients? So this was a, a trial uh, you know, funded by NIH, published by Dr. Nick Talley now a few years ago when they compared, for example, two psychotropic agents, amitriptyline and isetalopram, compared to placebo in a cohort of patients who have Rome criteria for functional dyspepsia. And some of these patients had delayed gastric emptying. So this was a mixed cohort of gastroparesis and dyspeptics. What they found was overall amitriptyline was helpful compared to placebo for symptom alleviation. And if you then look at these bottom graphs, only the individuals with normal gastric emptying shown here in the middle blue bar were more likely to respond as compared to placebo. Whereas if you do take individuals with delayed gastric emptying who otherwise meet criteria for dyspepsia, they are not so much uh, you know, likely to respond to the drug amitriptyline. And hence, this is another example from a therapeutic standpoint where measurement of gastric emptying is helpful in deciding whether, for example, we should be using tricyclic antidepressants. So how do I, uh, and, and then we look at uh, the, you know, some of these studies, obviously a lot of studies have shown that uh, delayed gastric emptying does not associate very well with the symptoms, but a lot of these studies did not use gastric emptying studies that one can call were ideal or were at gold standard. If you, however, uh, take selected studies that have measured symptoms and gastric emptying, and you look at the studies where a proper gastric emptying technique was used, you, you see a fairly robust association between symptoms and the gastric emptying results. So how do I answer this question one? Do I feel gastroparesis and dyspepsia are same disorders? And my answer would be no, I, I think uh, they are a spectrum of upper neurogastrointestinal disorders where uh, at least from how we understand things right now, they are driven by slightly different pathophysiological mechanisms. And, um, and uh, you know, although there could be symptomatic overlap, um, the, the core pathophysiology uh, may, uh, may, may differ. And is there a utility in performing gastric emptying study? And for that, my answer is yes. I think it's important for targeting treatment. It's important for understanding things like whether you are dealing with delay or slow, uh, you know, delayed or fast gastric emptying. And I think it's particularly important for those moderate to severe, uh, you know, patients who might need targeting uh, with a much more aggressive therapy than you might use for mild patients where a lot of the time dietary manipulations as well as lifestyle changes would be helpful. So moving on to the next part of the talk, which is the question number two, what underlies pathophysiology of gastroparesis? This is a study that we now published slightly over 10 years ago. When we found was, when, where, what we found was if, if we look at full thickness gastric biopsies, so these are biopsies that are uh, uh, of the muscle tissue of patients uh, with diabetic as well as idiopathic gastroparesis, we see that about half of these patients um, have a substantial loss of interstitial cells of Cajal. These are the pacemaker cells in the, gastric, uh, in, in, in the gastric tissue. And this finding was present in both diabetic and idiopathic gastroparesis patients. So is this clinically relevant? We did a subsequent study where we associated gastric emptying uh, with these ICC counts, uh, and we found an inverse correlation between those, uh, be, be, you know, between the gastric retention. So the less ICCs somebody had, the more gastric retention or the less gastric emptying they were able to demonstrate. So I'm going to just talk a little bit about some of the animal work that the group has done. Uh, this was a study now for uh, now, you know, from several years ago when the group looked at uh, these non-obese diabetic mice, these are a standard mice model used in our laboratory. Uh, when, uh, when they undergo induction of diabetes, a subset of these mice develop delayed gastric emptying, whereas the rest remain resistant to development of delayed gastric emptying. 
So what we learned interestingly was that when you look at the subset that does develop delayed gastric emptying, they had a loss of KIT expression. KIT is the marker for interstitial cells of the hull. These mice has had greater oxidative stress levels and they had uh, an, an, an unseen expression or an unobserved expression of hemoxygenase one, whereas the mice that were resistant to development of delayed gastric emptying had an upregulation of hemoxygenase one, which led to our question, where is this hemoxygenase one coming from? And what we learned was that the, there were immune cells that express hemoxygenase one, and these immune cells were CD206 immunoreactive macrophages. So approximately 97% of hemoxygenase one positive macrophages were CD206 positive. CD206 is an established biomarker for anti-inflammatory macrophages. We also looked at this from the human perspective, and we, uh, we found that in, in individuals with diabetic and idiopathic gastroparesis, there was a loss of these anti-inflammatory CD206 immunoreactive macrophages. These are samples taken from the antrum of these patients, and these macrophages are demonstrated by these arrowheads uh, in the white. Uh, these are the cells that you see here in red. They are quite diminished in both diabetic and idiopathic gastroparesis patients. We also did a study correlating uh, the ICC uh, counts as well as the, uh, these, uh, the, the, the counts of these anti-inflammatory macrophages, and we found a positive correlation. In other words, the more of these anti-inflammatory macrophages are there in the stomach, the more ICCs are likely to be there as well, suggesting that they play a role in protecting or preserving ICC numbers in, in the diabetic stomach. We also looked in the blood, looking at whether these patients with gastroparesis have some sort of uh, polymorphisms in the hemoxygenase one gene. And what we found interestingly was that uh, in, in patients with gastroparesis, there were, uh, there were these longer poly GT repeats in this hemoxygenase one, particularly in African-American individuals with gastroparesis. And not only they were there at a higher prevalence, we also found that they were uh, associated with symptoms, particularly the symptom of nausea in these patients. We then went on uh, from immunohistochemical analysis of gastric tissue, and over the last uh, five years or so, we have been performing next generation sequencing of these tissue samples. This was the initial study looking at bulk RNA transcriptomics, again, from the gastric muscle layer tissue. Um, and we found that when we compare diabetes with diabetic gastroparesis or uh, the normal individuals with idiopathic gastroparesis stomachs, uh, we find uh, anywhere between 100 to 200 genes were, uh, were, uh, were you know, differentially expressed between the two states. We then looked at genes that were common. So 65 genes were commonly altered in diabetic and idiopathic gastroparesis compared to their controls. And we did something called ingenuity pathway analysis where we are trying to understand signaling pathways that these altered genes may uh, connect. And interestingly, if you look here on the top two rows, granulocyte adhesion, as well as role of macrophages and fibroblasts, these were some of the most altered pathways in patients uh, with both diabetic and idiopathic gastroparesis. In orange uh, shown are the percentage of genes that were altered in these uh, stomachs that would associate with these two pathways. So anything above 20, 25% or so is you know, considered rather meaningful. We then went on to look at uh, from RNA to protein, um, and we did, uh, you know, did this study looking at, uh, uh, at, at you know, proteomics using somalogic platform. And we found that uh, although a, a number of genes were altered in both patients with diabetic and idiopathic gastroparesis, there were 40 genes that were common to the two states. Um, there were 25 of these, 40 were downregulated in both and 15 were upregulated. I'm not gonna belabor all the genes and names and these slides are self-explanatory with the color coding reflecting the, the, the degree of fold change that was seen in, in these genes. But when we look at, again, signaling pathways in diabetic gastroparesis, again, role of macrophages, fibroblasts, and endothelial cells comes up 
as the top altered pathway with genes such as CAM kinases, trypsin-1, interleukin-17 being some of the leading targets uh, that were seen uh, th that you know, connected that pathway. If you look at folks with, with, with idiopathic gastroparesis, again, the same signaling pathway with some of the same genes showed up in that group of patients as well. Now, more recently, we have been trying to characterize immune cells in the, in the human stomach at a much more uh, deeper level using single cell sequencing. And this is just a figure uh, which is unpublished at this, at this moment from some of our initial studies looking at, um, looking at the immune cell profiling of the human, of the human stomach. So how would I you know, you know, answer this, uh, this question too? Is there evidence of immune dysfunction in gastroparesis? My answer is yes. We feel there is a macrophage-based immune dysregulation and it's not necessarily an immune infiltration. So if you look at just the general immune cell markers, it's not like these stomachs are necessarily inflamed as one would measure by conventional uh, studies, um, um, uh, you, know, you know, using immunohistochemistry and so forth. There is, uh, there is a dysregulation, which is much more, uh, much more complex uh, than just a, an inflammation. So moving on to the third question, which is about some of the advancements in the endoscopic therapy space and uh, GPOM, which is short form for gastric pleural endoscopic pyloromyotomy. This is also called as third space endoscopy, uh, which is really a procedure that has been uh, popularized uh, uh, after a similar procedure done in uh, esophagus for achalasia patients when uh, an incision is made uh, at the lower esophageal sphincter and, and the muscle. Here, a channel is created um, in the pyloric area and a pyloromyotomy or an incision is made in the muscle. The goal is to relieve the pyloric, uh, the pyloric uh, you know, tension and hence facilitate a greater gastric emptying. So what about outcomes of this procedure? So if you look at uh, studies that are uncontrolled, um, this is a very recent meta-analysis where they included studies that at least had a 12-month follow-up. A lot of studies have had a much shorter follow-up of patients. But if you look at uh, these uh, selected studies with at least a one-year follow-up, there was a 61% pooled clinical success. Now, one has to remember there wasn't a placebo or a sham group in these studies. And these are, uh, these are the uncontrolled experiences, which is actually quite remarkable if you think of this space, which has a lot of unmet need for treatments. This study I would like to highlight, this was published last year uh, coming from a multi-institutional, uh, you know, multi multi-center cohort when they recruited 80, 80 patients uh, and they defined clinical success uh, by at least a 25% drop in the gastroparesis cardinal symptom index at 12 months. And 56% of patients, so slightly more than half of patients, met this rather rigorous cutoff um, for symptom improvement at 12 months. Not only that, about half of these patients, slightly more than half of these patients, underwent a repeat gastric emptying after GPOM at three months. And in half of those patients, gastric emptying had normalized, suggesting that uh, although gastric emptying may normalize, it's not a universal phenomena uh, that, that, uh, that may be seen in, in, in all the patients that undergo this procedure. What were the predictors of success? If the baseline gastroparesis cardinal symptom index, which is a scale that goes from zero to five, if it was more than 2.6 at least, which is consistent with moderate symptoms, and particularly if the symptoms were of bloating, or fullness and early satiety. Those patients were much more likely to respond than patients who had nausea or vomiting for, uh, as their presenting symptom. Also, if the four-hour gastric retention was more than 20%, and interestingly, if the procedure, if the patients felt better at one month, they were likely to continue to feel better at uh, you know, up to 12 months. So success at one month was also predictive. 6% patients uh, experienced side effects, Three patients experienced capnoperitoneum, which is essentially saying carbon, uh, carbon dioxide in the peritoneal cavity, which is a serious complication. But again, most of these uh, patients uh, felt better with conservative management. 
So how do we know which patients are likely to respond to this uh, procedure? Uh, at least our view is that not everybody responds. And we have been uh, uh, you know, thinking a lot and planning studies to understand which patients may respond better. So endoflip, which is essentially, again, a procedure uh, used in esophagus quite commonly uh, was used in the gastric pylorus to see if it might help predict who might respond better. So in this meta-analysis, uh, again, uh, you know, really just three studies, and they looked at patients who had a clinical success at, uh, uh, you know, after GPOM versus this versus a clinical failure. And interestingly, if you use a 50 milliliter balloon in the gastric pylorus, and if there is a greater post to pre-improvement in the distensibility. In, in, in other words, if uh, after GPOM um, you know, procedure, uh, their, distensi their distensibility index improved, uh, they are much more likely to have a successful response to the procedure. Similarly, if there, were, there was an increase in the cross-sectional area, uh, of the pylorus, uh, again, just based on two studies. So I, I would be careful in interpreting or generalizing these data, but at least some early signals that endoflip and its parameters of distensibility index, as well as the balloon distension itself, uh, showing the cross-sectional area, those two can potentially help us predict the clinical success. Where, whereas uh, the balloon pressures by themselves were not very predictive of who might respond. So concluding uh, with, uh, you know, trying to answer that third question, uh, should patients with gastroparesis undergo GPOM? And my answer is uh, that yes, for some, but not everyone. And we think that patient selection is going to be critically important. And we definitely feel, and we are engaged in more research in this space, trying to understand which patients uh, are likely to benefit from, these, uh, uh, from this procedure. So I hope I have uh, tried to uh, you know, answer these three, uh, three questions that, that uh, were based essentially on uh, what is it that uh, the public as well as the researchers are trying to think about or understand um, about these conditions uh, in you know, 2022. I would like to acknowledge uh, NIH and NIDDK for their support for our work, uh, particularly the work that I presented with the immune dysregulation, which has been funded uh, by, by NIDDK, both for the animal studies, as well as for the human uh, work, uh, uh, you know, using the full thickness gastric biopsies. Thank you for your attention.